Another day, another lecture. Okay, well, this is chapter 49, thyroid and parathyroid disorders. As I started to look through this chapter, I thought, I thought I taught this already. Well, no, because yes, no and yes. Thyroid and parathyroid were in our um, previous chapter, right? In our um, endocrine system. But now we're getting into the disorders. So we talked about some normal thyroid, parathyroid, what it looks like, where it's located. But now we're going to get into the disorders. This is a pretty interesting chapter, but let me give you some hints here. So notice your key terms. Be sure you know the definition of all those key terms. I will mention them through the chapter. Um, if I don't mention them, they might be on a test question, so always be aware of key terms because they're there for a reason. And, you know, sometimes when I'm looking at the key terms and I'm not quite sure, I don't know where it is in the book, I just look in the back, in the index, and I find that, that uh, word, and then I look at the definition on the page. So that's another way to find it if you don't see it when you're reading the chapter, because I know it's a lot of information to um, absorb. Um, as always, I'll try to point you to important points in this chapter. And also one more thing, well, actually a couple more things. I found in this chapter, very important is using Evolve. So when you guys use Evolve, if you go under Student Resources, you can use the Thinking Cap questions. There's a lot of that in the test and in the chapter that will really be helpful, I feel, as well as the Nursing Care Plan questions at the end. You can find those on Evolve. And also the NCLEX questions. All those answers are in Evolve also under Student Resources. So I think that that's really helpful for you in this chapter, as well as um, I think I mentioned the pharmacological capsules are all very important and nutrition segments and teaching segments. So I know that's a lot, right? Not only the words I'm telling you in the chapter, but also all those little tiny sections that you need to know. Well, you don't. You need, they're all interesting, but I will point you in the direction, but I just want you to be sure to know that you have a lot at your disposal and that there's a lot that you need to pay attention. I remember somebody was telling me that they took a class and that teacher took only questions from under pictures. They didn't take any pictures from the words in the book. So that's an interesting thing, and I kind of feel like that's what's happening in this chapter, that they take a lot of information from places that you don't suspect. So uh, I'll, gonna, let's go through this step by step. And I know it's not that many chapters, but it seems like a lot of information. So let's get started. All right, so let's start out with the lesson. So describe the pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, complications, and treatment of hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, thyroid cancer, hyperparathyroidism, and hypoparathyroidism. So yes, opposites assist in the development of nursing care plans for patients with disorders of the thyroid or parathyroid glands. All right, so let's start out with assessment of the thyroid gland and thyroid disorder. Uh, so thyroid disorders may cause an increase or decreased heart rate, respirations, blood pressure, and temperature. I'm talking general thyroid disorders um, and irregular heart rhythms. So it's important to know how much the thyroid does affect either hyper or hypo how it affects our heart rate, our respirations, our blood pressure, and our temperature, and also our heart rhythms because of calcium and phosphorus. So let's notice that as we go through the lecture. Also, um, what are the key components of the nursing assessment of a patient with a thyroid disorder? So we're going to be talking about some things like that. 
So uh, let's look in the book, a health history. So as usual, we want to take a good health history, uh, height, weight, emotional, mental status, because in thyroid, it really affects emotions, sleep, energy. So we'll notice that as we go along. Um, also, weight change. Notice a lot about weight, hypo, hyper. It depends. One, you're going to gain weight, one, you're going to lose weight. So health history is important uh, to notice weight. So we would take our weight along with the vital signs. Um, also, we want to pay attention to like uh, menstrual cycles, sexual dysfunction, hydration, whether they're thirsty, they're changing urine output. I know it sounds a lot like the other chapter because it is an endocrine disorder. So yes, there are going to be a lot of similarities. And yes, you're going to feel like I already learned that. And that's a good thing, right? Because we're just repeating some information. All right, uh, back to our health history. We're checking uh, tissue turgor, uh, mucous membranes, bowel patterns. We're going to find out about how hypothyroidism affects constipation. So very interesting. And you probably know most of this. That's what's interesting, right? Um, also hot and cold. Sensitivity to temperature. That's one thing um, also that we're going to be noticing. All right. So physical exam. Again, uh, vital signs, height, weight. Notice their blood pressure their heart rate, whether it's high or low, may have tell you if it's hyper hypothyroidism. Um, their temperature, are they hot? Do they, are they cold? Um, what about their uh, hair texture? And what about their eyes? How do they look? Are they sunken? Are they bulging like exophthalmus, which we saw in the last chapter? We're going to look at the neck for any kind of enlargement from the thyroid, a goiter or enlargement in the neck. Uh, we're going to notice tremors. Do they have shaking, which may indicate calcium disorders? So a lot of these things, okay, could be Parkinsonism, but no, because we're talking about thyroid and parathyroid right now. So see, Shaking can be many things. Tremors can be many things. So as nurses, we have to learn uh, what these things can be and critically think. We're seeing something. What does it mean in this patient? And then we would look at the chart looking for certain information. All right. Sorry, I'm going on a rant. I understand. So let's get to diagnostic test. So this is pretty important to know that um, the most useful test of thyroid function is serum thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. I don't think I have that on there, do I? I think it's interesting. All right, but it's in your book under diagnostic tests and procedures. So you might as well highlight this because um, the most useful test of thyroid function is the measurement of serum thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, and serum tridothyronine, which is, I struggled with last time, right? T3 and thyroxine, which is T4, and then your thyroid stimulating hormone. All right, uh, radioactive iodine or RAI. Yeah, there's a lot of abbreviations in this chapter also. So radioactive iodine RAI uptake test uh, creates an image of the gland based on the distribution of the iodine. And we read about that um, in table 47.1, page 916. I'm trying to use page numbers this time too. Um, because it seems that, I don't know, it just seemed like it worked better for this chapter. Every chapter is a little different for us, and we, we need to learn a little bit differently each chapter. So I hope you feel the same way I do about learning in these chapters. All right. Um, so anyway, let's talk about for a thyroid scan, 
The patient ingests RAI, the radioactive iodine, um, and that creates an image of the gland based on the distribution of the iodine. Pregnancy is contraindicated due to possible harm to the fetus. I know we talked about that, like I said, the last chapter. Uh, thyroid ultrasound can be helpful um, if the doctor notices enlargement in your uh, th throat on exam, he may order just the thyroid ultrasound as a non-invasive test uh, to see if there's anything. Also, MRI or CT scan can be done. All right. Oh, my goodness. There's Graves' disease, exophthalmus. You're never going to forget that, will you? All right. Hype. What is that? Hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism. All right, be sure you notice what this is. Hyperthyroidism, Graves' disease. Okay. So, Graves' disease is the most common type of hyperthyroidism. So, signs and symptoms um, could be increased metabolic rate, hyperthyroidism, they're a little hyper. So everything is a little speed up, speeded up, sped up. Weight loss, nervousness in the mild form and in the severe form, they get really restless and irritable and they have sleep disturbances. Um, that's going to come into play a little bit later. I'm going to talk about sleep disturbances being really important. Exophthalmus is the classic sign here of hyperthyroidism. Uh, complications can be thyrotoxicosis crisis or thyroid storm. It's a medical emergency. And that is elevated thyroid hormones that cause tachycardia, hyperthermia, heart failure, restlessness, agitation, and even on to coma. So you can see how a tachycardia could be a crisis, a heart failure, heart uh, a crises, um, and then of course the coma. A medical diagnosis is made through decreased TSH and elevated T4. Medical treatment uh, could be drug therapy, so in that case it would be antithyroid drugs, and those interfere with T4 secretion. But when you're giving antithyroid drugs for hyperthyroidism, you have to watch out for hypothyroidism because you're suppressing that thyroid. So you want to watch for hypothyroidism. Very important to remember. So some other medica medications that can be given would be thionamides or PTU, tapazole. Now we talked about that in the last chapter. This drug though may take eight weeks to work um, and we want regular thyroid function tests to know that it is working. There are serious side effects to tapazole, uh, hepatitis, anything related to the liver. So liver symptoms could be a side effect, a granulocytosis, and we want to watch out for signs of um, infection because they might get susceptible to infection. So another type of medication would be iodides, which inhibits the synthesis of thyroid hormones. Uh, and it's used usually after the PTU or the tapazole or thionamides. SSKI, and we talked about that, the drops uh, given for exposure to radiation. Um, radioactive iodine, can be given alone or with antithyroid drugs, but it can cause discoloration of the teeth. So we want to take that with a straw, right? So it just like we did with the iron, so it doesn't discolor the teeth. All right, I'm just going to go through here. Um, let's look at the pharmacological capsule on this page 962. Um, patients on antithyroid drugs must be monitored for hypothyroidism. Well, there it is again. Must be important. 
All right. It does mention, this is one of the um, key terms that we talked about in the beginning of the chapter, parotiditis, and that's inflammation of the parotid gland. And that can occur um, with some medication for hyperthyroidism. So just be sure that when something's highlighted like that, um, you want to just take note of what it is. Let's become familiar with words and what they mean. Um, the pharmacological capsule, there's another one on this page that talks about iodine solutions can stain the teeth. Must be important. Should be mixed with a beverage and sipped through a straw. Okay. Now, let's talk about, on page 953, we're going to talk about nursing care of non-surgical hyperthyroidism. So we want to do our focused assessment, of course. And uh, for the patient with hyperthyroidism, significant data would include activity tolerance, bowel elimination, or pattern, appetite, weight changes, food intake. Uh, we want to know if they understand about their condition. Um, we want to measure our vital signs and height and weight and also document skin texture and edema. All right, so here I've talked about interventions and interventions are, uh, they begin on page 953. So the first one is decreased cardiac output. Oh wait, before I go on to that, sorry. Put on your thinking cap is on this page. And it says, explain why people with hyperthyroidism do not tolerate heat well. Well, I went and looked it up, but from now on, I suggest you guys start looking these up. Uh, it says increased thyroid hormones, metabolism, um, which seizes heat production. So the metabolism causes heat production, that increased metabolism. So that's, you know, that thinking cap, critical thinking, and makes us help remember some of the um, causes, some of the things that occur with our patients. All right, let's talk about decreased cardiac output. So monitor vital signs for any elevations, tachycardia, tachypnea. Signs of heart failure keeps popping up in this chapter. So what are the signs of heart failure? Well, they're tachycardia, tachypnea, dyspnea, confusion, and edema. All right, here's another one that's really important and that's sleep disturbance. They're so restless and jumpy, they have trouble sleeping. They can't settle down. So what do we do as nurses? Well, we want to encourage bedtime rituals, like a warm bath, something to settle them down um, and relax them. And of course, we wanna avoid caffeine. So uh, it's important and it's mentioned under sleep disturbances about bedtime rituals. And one of those would be a warm bath. Then the next thing is heat intolerance. We're moving on to the next page. And that basically is just wearing light clothing because they're so hot. Um, next one, inadequate nutri uh, nutrition. So see nutrition considerations. So when we're on, that on this page here, it's in red and it says hypothyroid and hyperthyroid patients may require adjustments to calorie intake that are appropriate to their metabolic needs. So I know we had talked about this too, uh, iodized salt. Iodized salt is the best way to obtain an adequate amount of iodine in the diet. Another important source of iodine is salt water seafood, not salt water taffy, no, no, not that one. All right. Um, Lack of iodine is associated with the development of a goiter, which is enlargement of the thyroid gland in adults and cretinism in infants. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. 
All right, uh, potential for injury. So that exophthalmus that they have, the bulging eyes, they're caused by deposits of fat and fluid behind the eyeball. Now, because their eyelids may not even be able to close very well, they may need to wear dark glasses, and that will help. They need eye drops as well. The other thing about this is that they have an altered body image because they're self-conscious of the bulging eyes. And if you've ever seen someone with this, well, I know you've seen a couple pictures now, and it kind of takes you aback when you look at someone like that, um, like they're staring at you like, it's just kind of strange. Um, no offense. I mean, you know, we have to maintain coolness as a nurse and not let that bother us. So, but the patients are very self-conscious of it, and they will wear dark glasses uh, to hide their appearance and we just want to reassure them that it's okay all right discomfort so these patients um, have some the, the tearing from the eyes because they don't have a they might even get dry uh, but they're gonna tear also but it's just not getting over the eye to uh, keep it uh, moist and they have a feeling of sand in their eyes a lot of times so elevating their head is a good way and reducing bright lighting uh, tinted glasses can make them feel more comfortable so that's under discomfort and then uh, they have di they might have diarrhea due to electrolyte imbalances or it could cause electrolyte imbalances so be sure that you clean them really well if they do have diarrhea. And that brings us to the patient teaching part on this page. And it says hyperthyroidism. Uh, this is a chronic condition that requires long-term care. And I'm going to add therapy. Uh, you must take your medications exactly as prescribed. Notify your physician of excess fatigue or depression, which may indicate hypothyroidism caused from your antithyroid drug. Interesting information there. All right, so what about, let's go to the next page, that you need surgery. Nursing care of the patient having a thyroidectomy. So you want to do your pre-op check, right? You want to, what are, what's the patient's vital signs before they have surgery? We also want to do uh, some teaching. And this says, demonstrate how to avoid straining neck incision by supporting the head when rising. So you would show them how to put your hand behind their head uh, when they sit up, just to support that. So it doesn't pull the stitches, right? And it remains comfortable. Uh, the patient usually recovers pretty quick from a thyroidectomy and they can be discharged in two to three days. Uh, Post-op care, as I said, is pretty quick, but you want to watch for thyrotoxic crisis. Now, what is that? Well, it talks about um, the... Sorry. The monitor and document the respiratory status and you want to have now when the patient wakes up they may find that there's a tracheostomy tray right by the bedside well that's because if they do go into a crisis or they do go into respiratory distress or laryngospasm that they have that we have this emergency tracheostomy tray at the bedside another thing we're going to watch for is that tetany or the almost like a seizure like activity it may start very small uh, with just the tremors and then go into an all-out tetany so we're going to watch for these things we're going to watch for decreased cardiac output 
Now, if you're following me, um, I'm on 965, ready to go turn the page. Um, so inspect the dressing on the front of the neck. And I know we've had another lecture like this where you have to look behind the neck also for any drainage because what if they're bleeding behind their neck and you don't see it and they're bleeding more than you think they should. So you inspect the dressing on the front of the neck and behind the neck. And then that thyroid crisis because when they have surgery and the doctor is manipulating the thyroid, I know they try not to do this, they try to be very gentle, but they can have uh, large amounts of thyroid that enters the blood and uh, that could be a crisis. And then 12 hours after surgery, they kind of crash and they show signs of hypothyroidism. Um, the complementary and alternative therapies box here is another good box on page 955. It says position changes and back rubs enhance the effects of prescribed analgesics. Now that's a really good thing to know for any surgery that it helps stimulate our gait pathways, our pain, closes our pain gate so that we feel good and it's, it's on the skin which helps uh, stimulate uh, our sensory so that we have decreased pain. Because the deep, deep, deep uh, area is where the pain is. So if we just tap the skin or rub the skin, it, we won't have as much pain. All right, so again, the altered body image that they have um, might be a scar and they might be self-conscious. It's right in the throat, neck area, unless they want to wear turtlenecks forever, it's going to be visible. Uh, we want to manage their pain, of course, after surgery. And remember, after any surgery or an invasive procedure, there's always a risk for infection. So we want to use that aseptic technique. Now, I just want to reiterate before we go on, um, on page 956, it does talk about thyroid crisis a little bit more. And it says thyroid crisis or thyroid storm. So I'm repeating this must be important can develop when large amounts of thyroid hormone enter the bloodstream during surgery, or when patients with severe hyperthyroidism develop a severe illness, which creates a stress on their thyroid, right? And so it can just go over the top. And uh, so during an illness or an infection, they could get hyperthyroidism and go into a hyperthyroid storm. Um, also, 12 hours after surgery, the patient thyroid crisis shows signs of severe hyperthyroidism, which is, this is good to know, tachycardia, cardiac dysrhythmias, vomiting, fever, and confusion. So I hope you're following me in the book. Okay. Now, here's a picture I know we had it in the last chapter, hypocalcemia. And these are our um, chivostic, which is the facial twitch, tapping a nerve, and the facial nerve um, causes a twitch. And then the trousseau sign is if you pump up the blood pressure cuff, um, the hand will curl in and kind of jerk. Very interesting. And as I said before, you can Google that and take a peek what that looks like. All right, so let's talk about hypothyroidism on page 956. And under before we get to hypothyroidism, right above that is the patient teaching. So in a thyroidectomy, if all of your thyroid gland was removed, you will need lifelong replacement of thyroid hormones. If only part of your thyroid gland was removed, you may feel tired for a while. However, this should improve as the remaining gland increases hormone production. 
Thyroidectomy scars usually heal, so they are eventually barely noticeable, and they can be concealed with clothing. Take your drugs exactly as prescribed. Nervous, nervousness and palpitations may be adverse effects of thyroid replacement drugs. Notify the physician if they occur. All right, so let's talk about hypothyroidism. It's the result of inadequate secretion of thyroid hormones. And if not treated early, hypothyroidism during infancy causes permanent retardation or cretinism. So there's that word cretinism. That's in infancy if hypothyroidism isn't caught in time. So under cultural considerations there, it says neonatal hypothyroidism, which causes cretinism if not corrected early, is much more common among Caucasians than among those of African heritage. So lots of little interesting information. All right, it also mentions myxedema in this hypothyroidism. So myxedema refers to edema around the hands, face, feet, and eyes. Uh, this can be caused from the atrophy of thyroid after years of Graves' disease and thyroiditis. That can be some causes. Now, it talks about gotrogens, goitrogens. So, this is on page 967. 957, sorry. And let's talk about those because they're pretty important. Goitrogens suppress hormone production. So these foods will actually suppress the hormone, the thyroid hormone. And they are soybeans, turnips, and rutabagas. Now, I don't know who eats rutabagas. I don't even know what it looks like. But... Nonetheless, those are in a category of goitrogens mentioned in your book. And they are important to know because they suppress thyroid hormone. So some signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, the metabolic rate slows. And then they get weight gain. They might get constipation. Remember, everything's slowing down. And they're in, they have an intolerance to cold. So they're cold all the time. You have to give them blankets and blankets. A medical diagnosis is based on free T4 and TSH, so on serum blood levels. Complications of hypothyroidism can be, um, it can progress to myxedema coma. And those main signs Remember, the myxedema in itself is the swelling of eyes, hands, feet, right? The main signs of myxedema coma are hypothermia, hypotension, and hypoventilation. All right, and there's a good picture I'm going to show you. It's in your book, but I know I picked it out, and it's on the next page. All right, um... Then cultural considerations is here too in your book. It says the incidence of hypothyroidism is 10 to 20 times higher in iodine deficient parts of the world. So that's a Democratic Republic of Congo and Nepal. All right, so let's talk about medical treatment. So Synthroid is a drug that might be taken for hypothyroidism. But in the elderly, we have to be careful. Um, let's say they started on a dose of Synthroid, but we begin to notice changes. We might notice some heart problems. Um, and maybe that dose needs to be changed. So it always, we've got to keep an eye out for changes in our patient that indicate something. And we have to figure out what it is. It's like, um, 
Sherlock Holmes. We're like Sherlock Holmes when we go visit our patients and try to figure out what's going on. All right, so uh, for elderly with heart disease, you want to start with a low dose because very sensitive to heart anyway, cardiac problems. So start with a lower dose. Better to do that than start with a high dose and then have problems, right? So let's look at the care plan for hypothyroidism on page 956. I guess it's on 958, I'm sorry. My eyes, my eyes. Okay, here's our patient uh, myxedema, what they look like, the swelling under the eyes, you can see. All right, so before we go on to the goiter, let's talk about this nursing care plan on hypothyroidism. Um, on page 958. It also is a very good thing here. Uh, table 49.1 is a comparison of signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. So you might look through that and you can compare their opposites. So that helps uh, to try to remember. You just have to remember which one's hypo and which one's hyper. So go to the nursing care plan, patient with hypothyroidism, and let's look at the patient problems. So reduced activity tolerance related to decreased metabolic energy. This one's important, inadequate nutrition related to intake greater than metabolic needs because they're slow, right? So they might be eating more than they can use so they're gonna gain weight. Uh, cold intolerance, that's important. So advise the patient to adjust the room temperature for comfort. And then as a nurse, we wanna keep them warm with blankets. And then uh, constipation related to decreased peristalsis, again, the slowing down. So we wanna encourage fluid intake for constipation and high fiber diet, fresh fruits and vegetables. And maybe the patient needs to be on stool softeners and an increase in activity if you can do that. Also, I know I mentioned uh, potential for disrupted skin integrity related to dryness. Well, no, maybe I didn't. Okay, that's important to know. So potential for disrupted skin integrity related to dryness. So what do we do about that? Well, let's look at the intervention. Advise the patient to decrease bathing frequency and use moisturizers. That's what we should do for a patient too. And imagine we can give them a back rub, give them lotion, make them feel good, but and help them with their dry skin. And if they start itching, scratching, and they have marks on their arm from that dry skin, just lather them up with lotion. Keep Try to keep them moist because that is uh, a problem of their condition. Plus, in the elderly, they tend to be dry anyway. And then can you imagine when you have this on top of that, uh, of just the regular dryness, that you're really going to scratch yourself up. So I'm um, staying with the care plan for a second. If you'll notice critical thinking questions. Now, those answers are on Evolve, but I've got them here. So let's read them. What is the most critical information you should teach the patient about hypothyroidism? Well, this is important. Lifelong treatment. They're going to be on lifelong treatment. Another thing is how can you help the patient to set priorities and determine daily activities? So discuss a typical day with your patient and their usual activities and then assist with the priorities because they don't have a lot of energy. So they're not gonna be able to do everything and that can lead to frustration. So let's just do the prioritizing, do the most important things first before they lose their energy. Okay, see how helpful those can be? All right, and when you turn the page to 960, you'll see some of the things I just talked about on interventions, the constipation being a problem, the disrupted skin integrity is a problem. Um, and also that pharmacological capsule there 
Any older patient who's taking more than 0.15 milligrams of L-thyroxine daily is at risk for hyperthyroidism. So the elderly, very sensitive. Uh, the altered body image, fatigue, and lack of knowledge. Hey, here's a put on your thinking cap. So a patient who was recently diagnosed with hypothyroidism complains that she has no appetite but gained 20 pounds over the past few months. What would you, how would you explain this to her? Well, their metabolism slowed down. They're eating, but their metabolism slowed down. So that's why they feel tired and they're less active, but they've eaten food and they're not using it up in the energy production. So that's important. All right, now we can talk to, about goiter. So goiter is the term used to describe enlargement of the thyroid gland. And that could be a simple thyroid, uh, simple gall, goiter, which is thyroid enlargement from normal hormone production nodules well that's another word that was in your key terms so these are um, just little nodules um, they can be benign or malignant nodular goiters usually surgically removed okay and here's a picture of a patient with a goiter See the enlarged neck. All right, let's talk about thyroid cancer. So it's not very common. Uh, it's fatal in less than 1% of all cases. Early stages, that nodule or that little lump, they can be felt on the thyroid. Um, if they get to their doctor in the early stage, the doctor may feel that and get an ultrasound to see if it's anything. It may not be anything. If the cancer spreads, enlarged lymph nodes can be felt in the neck. Patient may not show dramatic changes in thyroid hormone levels. Total thyroidectomy is the usual treatment. If malignancy spreads beyond the thyroid gland, more radical surgery may be indicated. Well, let me tell you a story here for a second. Uh, my, I think my family's weird. Uh, my brother-in-law had thyroid cancer, and he just went in for a regular physical. Now, all these things that I've told you, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and how the thyroid is affected or can affect the body, you would think that he would have had symptoms. It, I just still can't get over it. He had no symptoms whatsoever. Well, that's not uncommon in thyroid cancer, which... I found out. So uh, he had his whole thyroid removed and it did spread to the nodes, but because it is not such a bad cancer to have if you're going to have to have one. Uh, surgery may be followed with um, RAI treatment to destroy any remaining tissue that might harbor malignant cells. So that's another thing that's done after thyroid cancer surgery. Um, Five-year survival rate for thyroid cancer is among the highest of all types of cancer. Uh, but still, got to keep an eye on it. Got to get blood levels drawn. Got to get the neck looked at from time to time. All right, now let's go to parathyroid disorders. Now, I have a story for this one, too. All right, so let's look at the assessment. So assessment, I um, want to look at our health history. Do they have any muscular skeletal problems? In other words, any kind of twitching or other problems with their bones? Okay, I'll tell you the story now. All right, so my husband actually had parathyroid um, problem when he was younger. And you know how he found out? This is so interesting. So he was only 13. He threw a baseball. He threw a baseball to his brother and his arm broke. Well, that's because his he had a parathyroid problem. And the calcium was not 
was being taken out of the bone and his bone got weak and he ended up with a broken bone. So again, health history, history of muscular skeletal problems. Urinary frequency or stones, calcium. We're gonna talk a lot about calcium in parathyroid. So urinary frequency or stones, calcium stones can be formed and that could be, oh, you know, when you talk to your patient, you find out, yeah, they've had stones and they've had a broken bone, calcium. Physical exam, take their vital signs. That's what VS is, by the way, not Victoria's Secret. We want to do Chavostic or Trousseau sign due to hypocalcemia. Diagnostic tests and procedures, so some blood tests that would be done would be um, calcium, phosphate, creatinine, uric acid, magnesium, and parathyroid hormone. Uh, radiographs or x-rays. So if excess calcium is pulled from the bones, their bones on x-ray are going to look weak. They're good. It will show on an x-ray that they're hypocalcemic in their bone. Remember, you've got calcium in the bone, calcium in the serum. So that's one thing that they have to pay attention to. So the calcium is pulled from the bone uh, to try to help the parathyroid. So dental exam, there might be changes in their teeth. Again, that's calcium. EKG may show signs consistent with calcium imbalance which may be manifested as an alteration in electrical activity. So their heart rate may be irregular, or they might have a few skipped beats. Okay. Hyperparathyroidism, page 961. Trying to keep up, keep up with you here. 961. Hyperparathyroidism, secretion of excess parathyroid hormone caused by a tumor or adenoma. Signs and symptoms, they can be vague, but then they get the weakness and lethargy. They might have depression and weight loss. And I say to look at table 49.2, which compares signs and symptoms of hypoparathyroidism and hyper parathyroidism. So we had a table about um, just hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Now we've got a table for hypoparathyroidism and hyperparathyroidism. All right, so medical diagnosis is made um, blood and urine tests, elevated serum calcium because it's pulled from the bone, decreased serum phosphate, elevated parathyroid hormone. So the medical treatment, uh, they can have a surgical intervention. We're on 962 now, by the way. Um, medical treatment and surgery. Now that can be complicated because the parathyroid gland isn't just where it should be always. Sometimes it's in the me more into the mediastinum, so surgery can be complicated due to that, so they don't always like to remove the whole parathyroid gland. Uh, drug, lower serum calcium levels, high fluid intake. So we want to lower their serum calcium levels and increase fluids. And it talks about that under uh, the drug therapy. All right, nursing care. Page 963. So, potential for injury. Let's now let's look at that nursing care of patient with hyperparathyroidism. Okay, because it's got a couple really important points to notice, and one of them is. Okay, we've talked about weakness and fatigue, right? With hyperparathyroidism. Also potential for injury related to decrease and to weakness and decreased bone mass. 
Remember, broken arm, decreased bone mass. The serum calcium's pulled, the calcium's pulled from the bone. All right. Also important to know is that potential urinary obstruction related to urinary calculi. So calcium stone can cause urinary obstruction and could cause a hydronephrosis, could cause um, other problems, pain, right, from stone. We want to uh, be aware of constipation related to altered intestinal motility. And then, of course, if our patient isn't aware of their condition, we want to try to uh, make them aware so they can help themselves. All right. Signs and symptoms after thyroid surgery. So post-op care. Signs uh, parathyroid dysfunction may occur. Signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia could be painful cramps. Medical diagnosis, signs and symptoms. That's my SNS, signs and symptoms. And blood studies. So they go by your signs and symptoms. For instance, do you have weakness? Do you have tremors? Do you have cramps? Muscle, a lot of muscle cramps. Uh, blood studies, low serum and urine calcium. Medical treatment, you can take calcitrol, oral calcium and vitamin D. A lot of times those pills are together. Nursing care, decreased cardiac output is pretty important because it's related to dysrhythmias and heart failure secondary to the hypocalcemia. So be sure you note that uh, on page 964, one of the problems, goals, and criteria outcome, hypoparathyroidism, decreased cardiac output related to dysrhythmias and heart failure. So keep an eye on their pulse and their rhythm. That's why it's important to note when you listen to their heart, is it regular or irregular? Because if you listen to it and it was regular and the next nurse listens and it's irregular, it's going to tell her something might be wrong. And then if you play detective, you can put all these things together and maybe come up with a diagnosis. Let, at least let the doctor know, right? If there's any changes in the patient's condition, you always want to let the doctor know. All right, nursing care. Um, again, decreased cardiac output related to dysrhythmias and heart failure. We want to do seizure precautions because of the calcium. So if there's been any recent seizure activity or if the patient shows severe neuromuscular irritability, follow seizure precautions. Notice how that calcium, the muscle, the heart is a muscle too. That's why the heart is so sensitive to calcium and our muscles are sensitive. We have, can have tetany, we can have seizures. All right, teach patients with uh, signs and symptoms of calcium imbalances to have a medical ID alert card or band uh, to notify other healthcare providers. So, hey, a couple questions for you before we finish out the slides. Which of the following is not a symptom of hyperthyroidism? I'll give you a minute. Not a symptom of hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism. All right, so the answer is D, weight gain. It's usually weight lost in hyper right? Because they're hyper. So symptoms of hyperthyroidism include irregular cardiac rhythms, heart failure, weight loss, muscular weakness. Weight gain is a symptom of hypothyroidism. 
One more question. Which of the following is an incorrect statement about Graves disease or hyperthyroidism? I'll give you a second to read through. Right, if you guess C, you are correct. Graves' disease develops most often in young women. Now, notice this is incorrect. So all the other statements are true. So they don't develop middle age, it's young women. Okay? All right, thank you for your attention and good luck. Study, read through everything. Um, I think you'll get the hang of it once you get used to hyper, hypo, thyroid, parathyroid. So go through those um, where the comparisons I think are really helpful for you. Plus the, the little notes I said that this is really important. Okay, if you have any questions, be sure to ask or text or email me. Thank you.